Chapter 70 to 72 and interlude, Kristen. I cannot believe you missed it, Lena, said Rainies, as the brand new as of yet nameless dragon attempted to snatch some charred meat from her hands. It was not doing well, baby dragons weren't known for their grace or athletics. Neither can I, she sighed before smiling at me ruefully. It will be good for my work though. Ah, you were the one who set her onto this, weren't you Renera? It's good to see someone cares about the source of our family's power. I didn't need to ask to know who she was referring to. Dragons are a sore point for him. Valyrian died at the same time as my brother, Eamon, and I think a part of him died then. Defending Viserys was a weird feeling but, well, maybe I was softening towards him. His proud father routine, that he hadn't dropped once since he learned of the babes, was starting to get to me. Rhaenys was silent for some time until she finally let the hatchling seize his meal, then she looked up with an expression I had never seen on her face before. Perhaps I am too harsh on him at times. I know it must seem that way to you. I do love him, he is my cousin but he is not fit to be king. I shrugged in response and she snorted. He should have married Lena, he should have married you to her son. He should have taken control from Otto the moment that man seized it, he should have sent Alison from the capital the moment she sought to influence you. At my silence, she continued, head tilted to gaze at the clouds. There is a softness in him. Not nearly like Enes, but it is there. He lets it rule him too often, he hates the pain it causes him too much to go against it. She looked down at me. He could not marry Lena because she reminded him of Emma and because he feared she would meet the same fate. And because he feared having you as a good mother, I pointed out, not wanting to start an argument over whether Rainies feared the same fate for Lena. Rainy snorted in amusement, lips quirking up at the thought. I am glad I did not marry him, mother, Lena said, her ears red as Lucerys gurgled happily from her lap. You would have been queen, Rainies pointed out but there was no real heat in her tone. I got the sudden sense they'd had this conversation before. Bah, I know what you will say. I am happy enough to see Laner by Renera's side. Happy enough to see the lords of Westeros bow to a woman. Lena smiled at that and Rainies hummed before procuring another cube of charcoal meat for the dragon. Lucerys laughed as it once again began its back and forth scrabbling for the treat Rainies dangled in front of it. I let my thoughts wander. Alicent and Otto had been up in arms about another Valerian dragon. It was one thing to let Rainies' children have dragons but their children too. It meant that for at least three generations the Valerians would have access to power no other house but the Targaryens did. It was establishing them as a cadet branch, the optics were not great for House Hightower. Viserys had defended Lucerys though and he'd managed it without making any referral to Daemon, which I considered impressive. Annoyingly, the birth of a new dragon so soon after the decision to go to war with Dorne once winter was at an end was being viewed as some sort of blessing by those who cared about that sort of thing. I would have to be careful of that or I may just end up getting sucked into a war I did not want. Still, I had dug out those long-forgotten plans for a procession across Westeros once more. Now that my due date loomed ever closer, it seemed like a good idea to start planning once more. The Stormlands would likely be first, then the Reach. Followed by the Westerlands, the Iron Islands, the Riverlands, and the North. The Veil would be my happy ending to the whole thing, providing Jane didn't strangle me or Helena didn't plan my assassination. There were still the little details to hammer out of course but the rough plan had been easy to assemble. Mother could you look over some of my research tonight, asked Lena, breaking the awkward silence. Rainies paused in her teasing of the young hatchling and raised a black eyebrow. What subject, she asked. General hatching methods. Alex's writings disagree with Enar's originals. Rainies hummed at the question. The hatchling apparently sensed her distraction and scrabbled off around her elbow to lay siege to the platter. Both Lena and Rainies seemed intent on the conversation and so his feast went undetected by them. I almost had to cram my fist in my mouth to stop my giggling. What does Gaiman write? asked Rainies. Surprisingly little so far. He agrees with Enar at times though. Hmm, I'll look it over. I would have thought the man who hatched Vagar and Meraxes would have more to say on the matter. The current writer of Vagar beamed and nodded, then noticed the hatchling and my evident amusement before frowning. Mother, he's had the entire platter, she exclaimed as I got witness a dragon vomiting for the first time ever. Merriment over we trooped inside, Lena cradling a very unhappy hatchling and Rainies carrying the sleepy Lucerys. You should move back to the manse for your pregnancy, Rainies said, making me pause in surprise. I'm not sure father will put up with that. He wants me close. Lena tensed a little, well aware of the consequences that Viserys could bring down for disobedience. 
Of course he does. Worry work, she smiled fondly. He was all of 14 when I fell pregnant with Lena and yet I swear he fretted over me more than my father did. That's surprising, I said as we reached Lena's room and deposited Luceris in his crib and the dragon in his wicker cage. Besides, if I moved here again I might miss out on those wonderful family dinners he keeps planning. It was one dinner but he'd ambushed me with it after Allison's meltdown about the egg. Naturally I was thrilled about that and approaching it in a purely rational manner. Ugh, it was part of his repair family bonds attempts and I'd agreed to drag Laner along with the caveat that I could leave if I became overly ill. He'd agreed with a look that said he'd better see some real evidence of illness if I decided to bounce halfway through. Maria and Alice helped me dress that night, fastening me into a dress reminiscent of the Riverland style with a dash of Westerlands in the layers. I even elected for a little bit of bling. Tasteful though, I wasn't going to weigh myself down with an entire mind's worth. Experience had taught me Alicent was happy to wear something bordering on scandalous to rub in the salt about the changes to my own figure. I scowled at myself in the mirror and then more deeply when the twins started up with their shit. I laid a hand on my stomach. You better be well behaved tonight or you're being born grounded, I told them. Your grace. Alice called from the other room and I blushed at being caught. Nothing, Alice. I was talking to the children, I called back and she laughed. I cannot wait to meet them, she said, entering behind me with one of my nicer mantles. Twins like Sarah and I. If they're half as rambunctious as Sarah and yourself I'm running away to Essos. Lionel probably considers his position as hand a respite from the two of you, I commented dryly. The girl just laughed. We do like our pranks and we've even gotten Laris one or two times, she said, grin stretching her face. But, well, it's the greatest thing in the world to have a twin. It's another part of yourself. We even had our own little language when we were children. Oh, do tell me about catching Laris out, I said. Laris only grew more serious as the months went on, not that I saw him that much these days. Oh the classic water over the door, once we painted ink on that Myrish far eye he so loves and another we covered him in flour. I laughed along with her. You think he would be grumpy with us, but he would just smile and promise to get even with us someday. There was a fond smile on her face. Laris may be the butt of all jokes in the strong family but any one of them would happily kill an outsider who mocked him. I liked that about them. Did he ever? I asked as she fastened the mantle. Oh. No, never. We're much too good, she chuckled. Sarah says she doesn't even think he ever tried. Well, you shall have to invite him for a meal after I have had the children. He is a friend and we haven't spoken in so long, I said finally as she straightened the mantle to sit properly on my shoulders and stepped back. I'm sure he'd like that, Alice said with a smile. Who would like what? asked Laner, stepping into the room and looking as handsome as ever. He'd had a haircut recently, I noted, his silver hair had been cut to shoulder length and he was in the process of tying it back. He had people to do that, of course, but his insistence on staying at the manse meant they weren't here. Inviting Laris for a meal, I said, coming over to help him with his hair. Oh, he seemed quite nice. Quiet fellow though. Thank you, Renera, he mumbled and let his hands drop. Oh how I wish we did not have to attend this tonight. You and I both, husband, I said. But when father calls we must answer. We can always set mother on him, he suggested and I laughed. Rainies had become a go-to threat for her children in recent months. That would be cruel. Your mother is a force of nature. That made him cackle. There is a reason that father married her. He says every time he is with her he is reminded of sailing through a storm. That was positively romantic from Lord Corlys. Well, I know what drew your father to your mother but honestly I don't understand what her stake is, I said and Laner smiled, eyes gleaming with mischief, stepping away from me as I finished his hair. Then he laid his hands on my hips and planted a kiss on my lips. And here I thought Valerian men were irresistible for you Targaryen women, he teased and I realized I was blushing a deep and vibrant red. Oh, he's back to playing that ridiculous game of his. Not so irresistible that I will not slap you if we are late, I mumbled back, placing my hands on his cheeks. I let him initiate another kiss only to pull back as Maria and Alice got the giggles at our display of romance. Or rather, Laner's display of teasing me. It was, I'd come to realize, something he took immense pride in beyond the obvious alibi it gave us. My blushes were a source of ongoing amusement for him. Joffrey and Lena too. I could understand his position. Blushes won from those three on my part were always satisfying too. 
Admittedly, I won them from Joffrey and Lena in the privacy of the manse lest Alicent decide to concoct another little story for the court. Not that her control of rumors should be so complete these days, I mused as we began our journey arm in arm. We now knew that Mushroom had been the progenitor and purveyor of many of her more damaging rumors. Without him at hand, well, court gossip was hard to control. Mushroom had a talent that I doubted many others had. Our friend had struck a massive blow to her and still managed to forge an alliance. I wonder if he lied to her. Told her some story about Mushroom betraying her to justify his actions. I had not heard any black speaking of Mushroom or any kind of mole so I doubted he had actually been planning those things. It could be our friend killed him to create a job opening or Mushroom made a joke about it. We'd answered a few questions and yet were just as in the dark as when we started. Brooding? Asked Laner. No, thinking about Joffrey's friend. Laner laughed at that. Joffrey will have him soon enough. Do not doubt his skill, he assured me. There are too many mysteries in this world at the moment, Laner. Can you blame me for tackling the one that I have a chance of solving? I asked as my mind went to the foundations of Runestone, Joffrey's friend, the reason black powder did not work on Westeros and everything that ever came out of Wisdom Jarrett's mouth regarding magic and alchemy. We came to halt in front of the doors that led to another fun family dinner and paused to compose ourselves before one of Viserys' men pulled the door open and we were announced. Greetings were called as were shown to our seats and we barely sat down before another two guests arrived. Ah, great. Viserys has invited Otto and his son. We started off with a small bowl of pumpkin soup and fresh bread. The pungent aroma set my stomach rolling the moment it was placed before me and that, combined with the initial distinct lack of alcoholic drinks, tipped me off as to who was likely involved in choosing the menu. I sighed, resigned myself to an unpleasant night, and forced a few spoonfuls down before Darren's fussing gave me an escape I seized with both hands. It does not seem like it has been a year since I first saw him. I said, attracting the table's attention. He has grown so much and already walking. In truth, he was as average as toddlers got but the implication that walking at about 16 or 17 months was special had Viserys preening as he gazed at his third son with evident love and pride. Alicent merely gave me a tight smile, Otto looked constipated and Gwen took the opportunity to drop his spoon with relief. I frowned at that. The accident Joffrey had arranged had damaged his arm most of all, forcing him to use his offhand. Ambidextrous this boy was not yet Otto did not seem to care his son could barely feed himself. He will be a fine addition to House Targaryen, said Otto after a moment of evaluating what I could possibly mean by my phrase. There were a small crowd of nobles black and green both that figured I couldn't possibly love my siblings, Otto was evidently a member. He cries too much, Grouse the only sibling I've ever given an actual thought to physically harming. Emond was taking this whole dinner as well as Daron, which was impressive given the almost four-year difference in age between the two. The time of Emond's fostering was looming ever closer and his behavior continued to degenerate. I had to wonder if Alicent was egging him on. If she was, Viserys would have her measure soon enough. He is a babe. They cry, Emond. You and Aegon did so endlessly. Lucerys does so. When he is older you will think differently. My voice managed to hit warm despite the smell of pumpkin making me want to vomit but all Emond did was clench his fists and stare at his own untouched soup. Viserys cleared his throat. Well said, daughter, he said, smiling. The others at the table made hasty nods whilst Otto barely covered up his utter disgust with his second grandchild. Another thing they disagreed on, according to Joffrey's spies, not that one needed spies to hear of the arguments between father and daughter these days. They were quite happy to bellow at one another within earshot of even hardcore blacks. Otto found the mess she'd made of Aegon and Emond alarming. He'd also pointed out Helena's obvious attachment to me as a problem. Honestly, Daron was the only grandson who did not meet with scorn and that was because he was too young to have managed to disappoint his grandfather yet. We carried on eating, or rather everyone else did. I took the opportunity to let my stomach relax a little. It very much did not approve of the pumpkin soup. As the awkward silence descended once more, Laner gave me a pleadingly look. I gave a half a thought to vomiting all over the table but I couldn't do it on command and whilst the pumpkin soup was pungent it wasn't enough to truly set it off. Do you not like pumpkin soup, Renera? asked Alicent as the rest finished up. Minus her brother who'd gotten through half his dish and gotten most of it down his doublet. I felt a pang of sorrow at that. He'd used to be such a lively lad, the apple of many a woman's eye. Now, now he could barely raise his eyes from his soup and could barely hide the embarrassment at being so helpless. My stomach does not, I fear, I replied, 
immensely discomfited. I had caused Gwen's accident. Indirectly, but I still had. Allison's thin smile would have made me angry were feelings of guilt and nausea not conspiring to make this dinner extremely unpleasant. Renera and I are very glad to see you on your feet, Sir Gwen, Laner said smoothly, giving me time to grab some juice in attempt to settle my stomach. Thank you, Sir Valerion. Thank you also for the help of Maester Gerardis, your grace. I am in your debt, he said in reply, eyes flickering up. Otto's thin smile dropped back into place but curiously, Allison's smile was a lot more warm. He was her baby brother after all and I imagine that Otto was not the warm and friendly father figure Viserys was. I felt a pang of something at that and turned my attention to him. He caught my gaze and smiled, so I returned it, causing his own to widen in turn. The servants came and collected the dishes and went off to prepare the next course. Have you given any more thought to the recommendations I provided on Dorne, Viserys? asked Otto. It was odd to see him referring to Viserys in such an informal way. I was used to the simpering your graces that seemed tailor-made to set my teeth on edge. Hmm, I've given them a look over Otto, but truly I think we should wait before we decide on any solid plans. The war may not even happen yet, he rumbled by way of reply. Otto nodded and took a drink of wine. Besides, I do believe I requested no politics. This is a meal to celebrate our family. Of course, Viserys, I apologize. This business has me out of sorts I suppose, Otto replied after he'd placed his cup back into place. Oh I quite understand. This business with Dorne seems to have come out nowhere. Marcher lords are a proud lot. They see a weakened Dorne as an opportunity and things seem to have spiraled from there, Otto said. They are eager for glory. Revenge, I said. They are eager for revenge. Otto smiled that thin smile as even Gwen's head shot up to stare at me. They want to repay the Dornish for their raiding and rapes, for the pain they've caused in the marches over the years. If any one of those houses are placed in charge of Dorn after we win, there will be a bloodbath. I was surprised by how heated my own tone was. Otto went to answer but Laner cut him off. I agree. There is a lot of bad blood in court right now, all of it aimed at the Dornish. I dread to think what may happen if those men are given innocence to rule. Viserys stroked at his mustache and hummed thoughtfully. Something to bear in mind, father, I said, cutting off Otto once more. Then Alicent joined in, leaving her father floundering somewhat. Please, there are children at the table, she said, smile strained. Viserys, we agreed no politics. I let my eye wander to Daron, who was still chewing on some leftover bread and Emond, who was scowling at his shoes as he kicked his feet back and forth. I arranged my face into a smile and gave her a nod. You are right. My apologies, my queen. Indeed, daughter, Otto managed to choke out. The next course interrupted whatever she was going to say to that and my stomach gave an almighty heave as pork seasoned with mind-boggling amount of spices were laid out before us. A dazzling array of vegetables, also well seasoned, provided a side. You have gone pale, Renera, are you well? asked Alison, eyes twinkling with amusement. I clenched my fingers around my fork and forced a smile. Well enough. Nausea forced my voice into a half-whisper which drew Viserys' concern. If you need to leave, he said, frowning. Pungent and strong smells make her sickness worse, Laner explained to Viserys. I am somewhat surprised the kitchens did not know. They have been instructed in the past. Viserys' suspicious violet eyes traveled over to Alicent who was poking at her pork and looking shocked. I had to hand it to the bitch, she was certainly an excellent actor. She feigned that shock so well even I wanted to believe her. But I was very clear who would be attending, she gasped. Renera, you have my word I will speak with them about forgetting such a requirement. Thank you, my queen, I mumbled. Then my throat clenched and I nearly did wretch all over their meal. Laner stood up swiftly and pulled me up with him. Viserys followed him up, eyes wide with concern. I shall take her back to her rooms, your grace, else I fear an accident. Viserys nodded then turned his eyes back to Alicent who looked very concerned. So concerned it wasn't possibly real concern in fact. Do you require any help, Sir Laner? asked Gwen, also rising. Laner took pity on him and Gwen joined me a moment later, both men almost hauling me along in a way I wanted to protest I did not need and yet, yet doing so would see me throw up on them. When we were safely away and by a window, I was allowed to lean my head out for a while. King's Landing was not fragrant by any stretch of the imagination but it beat Alison's idea of a hearty family meal. You may escape. Sir Gwen, Laner was saying. Thank you for your aid. 
I should thank you, Sir Laner. I have no idea why father dragged me to that dinner but it was quite excruciating. Truly, the confessors must weep to have never devised a torture so painful, he retorted. I laughed and then groaned before pulling my head back in. Sweat was prickling across my forehead and the little pumpkin soup I had forced was suddenly sitting very uneasily in my stomach. We need to go, I gasped out and Laners widened with alarm before he scooped me into his arms, called a goodbye to Sir Gwaine and took off at full speed down the hallways. If I weren't so damn sick that might just have induced a case of the vapors. As it stood, all I could lament was that every jolt and jostle sent my stomach spinning even worse. We eventually reached my rooms without me soiling myself in public but it was a near thing because we'd barely stepped inside the room when it did come up and I was left covered in it due to the angle Laner was carrying me at. Which naturally did not help matters and left me retching more. To his credit, he did not drop me in disgust although I could tell the thought had crossed his mind. Instead he left me to Maria and Alice ministrations as he went off to change his clothes. The two women had rushed from their seats the moment Laner had slammed the door open with me in his arms and were quick to strip me to my shift and small clothes and reintroduce the chamber pot to my life. Then they called for the maid to draw some hot water for me with emphasis on hot. I gave them both a grateful smile. Laner returned a moment later, dressed in fresh clothes and looking worried. I knew you did not wish to attend the meal but this was a little drastic, no, joked Alice as we waited for my bath to be filled. Everything served tonight read like a list of what would set her off, said Laner stiffly. And Alison very much planned it that way. At that both my ladies gained dark looks on their faces. Laner nodded in response to their outrage. I am going to fetch Alanis to give you a look over, Renora. I know it's just sickness but we do not know what those seasonings were. If it is something dangerous to you or the child, he trailed off and I nodded. I suspected it was the smell, Taylor made to send my stomach spinning by Alicent because she was a vengeful cow that couldn't let things go even when it would be healthier for her too. We will keep a close eye on her, Sir Laner, promised Maria. He bid them both goodbye and disappeared out the door. We waited in silence and as time went on, my stomach slowly settled. I'll kill that woman one day, I vowed as I settled into a low couch with Alice's help. Then at, at Maria's stricken expression, I elaborated. I jest. I would not kill her but when she is as petty as this it is hard to remember the seven and their teachings of forgiveness and compassion. An awkward silence descended and Alice Strong rode to my aid. Well, generosity is part of worship and a certain sister of mine tells me you have a certain bottle in your collection, she said, eyeing said bottle, and I laughed. Alice that is completely inappropriate, Maria gasped, thoroughly distracted from my momentary slip by how God's damn rude she was for asking. You may have some, Alice, as long as you understand that if you drink it all your sister will gut you, I told her, remembering the storms of panic and tears she'd coaxed me through in recent months. She could raid that alcohol all she liked for the friendship she'd given me. Oh, don't worry, she replied. I'll definitely leave her some. Half a glass should be fine, right? I was saved from replying by Maria helping me to my feet as a maid announced the bath ready. Alice tipped her glass to me and took a gulp as the door shut. I was helped into the warm water and sighed at how heavenly it was. You better keep an eye on her, I murmured finally. Someone needs to keep an eye on you, said Maria and I could picture her worried frown. I will shout should I require aid. Truly, if you do not watch her she will have the entire bottle and half the cabinet to boot. Maria groaned, no doubt remembering the morning Alice had been found half-conscious in the stables at Dragonstone. Very well, Renora, but you are not to climb out of that bath without aid, she told me, eyes serious. You will hurt yourself. Seven help me if you fall. Go, I chuckled. You have my oath that I will call for you should I need to get out of the bath. She went and I sighed happily, settling myself in for a long soak. Then I would be due a poking, sorry, a visit by Alanis that would no doubt result in her chiding me about fried goods. Ah well, I could deal with that. At least I was out of that awful dinner. And then I heard Maria scream. The fear the scream brought drove me upright and sent water splashing over the sides of the bath, drenching my surroundings. My heart beat like a drum in my chest as I listened for any indication what had happened. There was nothing but silence, no sound of metal on metal, no sound of any fighting. Maria. I called, wondering if Alice had decided to play some cruel prank on the woman yet Alice was not given to doing so if she was on duty. Maria. Alice. I am getting out of the bath. A crash of the door to my room slamming open and Sir Stefan's shout to raise the alarm was my only answer. 
I climbed to my feet before my mind caught up with what a stupid idea that was. By the time I realized how fucked I was it was too late, the world seemed to move beneath me and like the queen of all idiots, I toppled backwards over the rim of the bath. I saw stars for a moment as the back of my head bounced off the floor. My legs seemed to be afire as I struggled to pull them over the rim of the bath. Tears burned in my eyes at the pain. The pain in my legs, the back of my head and the pain in my back. A fluttering feeling caused my stomach to tense into a cramp and I raised a fearful hand to my belly. Seconds later, Sir Stefan Darklin reached me, eyes wide with worry. His white cloak was draped over me and to my horror I discovered that my legs weren't quite up to the task of holding me upright. I whimpered as I realized I likely had a whole host of pulled muscles. But my pain was not important. Maria had screamed. Your grace dash. I fell when she screamed. By the seven what happened? At my question he gave me a pained glance and I became aware of Maria sobbing. Maria. Alice. Renera. Do not. Do not leave the room. Sir Stefan has sounded the alarm. Was Maria's choked reply and I could tell she was sobbing. Fear boiled within me and another spasm, another clench, had me bend over with a groan. Alice had not answered me, I realized. Your grace, the babes, he asked, eyes wide. It is too Earl Dash. No. Not this early. False contractions. Take me through there, I told him. It had to be false contractions. If they came now, they would die and not even my midwives would save them. So it had to be false contractions. Your grace, you must not, he said, then his eyes went even wider and a look of horror grew over his face. Your grace, you are bleeding. He raised a shaking hand to the back of my head and withdrew it, fingers red with my blood. I groaned at the sight. I do not care about me, tell me what has happened or take me through there. I commanded him. The sound of more men pouring into my rooms was my only answer as Sir Stefan closed his eyes and helped me along, like I was somehow leading him to his execution. My legs burned with pain as I forced them to bear at least some of my weight and now that Sir Stefan had pointed it out, I could feel the blood on the back of my head and soaking into his cloak. Another false contraction made me grit my teeth but I was not about to let that stop me. Where is her grace, demanded the voice of Kristen Cole. Right here, Lord Commander. Now will somebody tell me what is going on? Where are Alice and Maria? Cole turned at my voice, full of barely suppressed panic, frowning when he saw my nudity covered only by Stefan's cloak but my eyes weren't on him. They were on Alice Strong. Or the body that had once been Alice Strong. No, I moaned before I could help myself. No, this wasn't real. This was some head wound induced punishment. My legs gave way and Stefan caught me, picking me up bridal style as tears blurred my vision and my heart ached fiercely. No, not her. It wasn't real. I found her, I went to prepare a nightgown, she was just lying there, Maria choked out. Tears made it hard to see but the last moments of Alice Strong's life had been panicked. The glass of liqueur she had been drinking had spilled across the floor and I could see blood where she had clawed at her own throat. Her eyes were still open and her expression told me she'd died terribly afraid. Then one of the guards laid his cloak over her as if noticing my horror. It wasn't real. It couldn't be real. We have sent a runner to the hand, your grace, said one of the other men quietly. And the king. I couldn't answer through my sobs. Alice had been innocent. She had not deserved such a cruel death, had never harmed anyone. Gods and Sarah. This would break her. They had been close even for twins. It did not seem real. It could not be real. I struggled in Stefan's arms, wanting to go to her, to shake her awake and tell her that this prank was not appreciated. The black cloak did not move. Nobody shouted that I had been fooled. Her grace is bleeding, Sir Darklin, said Cole slowly, his tone icy. I managed to drag my gaze to him and saw nothing in his cool expression. It doesn't matter about me. I screamed at him. Cole's gaze shifted to me in surprise. I'm not dead. She struck her head attempting to get out of the bath, Sir Stefan replied as if I hadn't just screamed at his superior. He kept an expert hold on me as I struggled to launch myself at Cole. Another contraction made me gasp and stop my struggling, Cole's expression went from cool and blank to worried. Take her to the Grand Maester. Now, the Lord Commander ordered in a thunderous tone. Sir Stefan nodded and I struggled in his arms once more. No. No. You will leave me here. I will stay with her. I ordered but was ignored. 
Fresh tears streaked down my face as my struggling amounted to nothing in Sir Stefan's arms. Sir Darklin. Stefan paused and glanced back at Cole. You will stay by her side until you are relieved. No matter how long this matter takes. My white knight half bowed in response and we stepped out into the corridor. The ache in my heart burned once more. I wanted to struggle but yet another contraction ended that plan as soon as it entered my head. It could not be real. It was not real. Laurent Marbrand met us halfway down the corridor, his eyes wide with fear as he saw my form wrapped in Stefan's bloodstained cloak. Behind him, panting and struggling to draw breath was my father. The king did not look well, his skin blotchy as he choked and wheezed. Your grace, Marbrand started. Princess Rain Dash. Viserys' head snapped up and he surged forward, hands finding my cheeks and looking half out of his mind with worry. He's placed his forehead against mine and provoked fresh round of sobbing from me. Renera. Renera, what happened, he gasped. They killed her. They killed her. Was all I could sob out. She's dead and it should have been me. Viserys went pale at that but I couldn't see his expression through my tears. His hands left my cheeks and I sobbed again at the loss of contact. I wanted, for the first time since Damon, for him to hold me close and tell me everything was okay. Sir Marbrand, oversee Sir Cole in his investigation. I will take my daughter to the Grand Maester, Viserys said finally and lifted me gently from Stefan's arms. I curled close to him as my back and legs screamed in protest, sobbing into his fancy brocade doublet. What happened, he asked in a low voice, once we were moving again. Alice Strong appears to have been poisoned. According to Lady Stokeworth, she was drinking alcohol meant for the princess, he reported. I heard Viserys' breath leave his body in a single explosive breath and he was silent for some time. I clutched at him tighter and he responded in turn. And the head wound, he asked, voice a whisper. She fell dash, a contraction made me cry out in surprise and Viserys swore. She said they were false. It does not matter. Take me back father, I don't want to leave her, I choked out and Viserys shifted his hold on me. I wasn't even sure where we were in the keep currently. I should be there. I should tell Lionel. It's my fault. It is not your fault, little fire. It is not, whispered Viserys. The old nickname Prince Balon had once used for me set me wailing into his shoulder. Alice Strong was every bit a good woman as her father is a good man. She's nothing because she's dead. He winced at my volume and I buried my face in his shoulder once more. We reached the tower soon after and he placed me oh so gently down on the bed Melas indicated. No. No. Gerardis, I gasped, barely able to see the old man through my tears. Maester Gerardis is not here. I am quite adequate, I could have sworn his voice was a sneer. Viserys curled his hand in mine. I will be here, little fire. Should he fail you like Runsider I shall have his head along with whoever did this, Viserys assured me. I leant into his shoulder once more and he dropped an arm round my shoulders. She struck her head on the floor. I fear she has injured her back and pulled the muscles in her legs. She also told me she was experiencing false contractions, Sir Stefan was saying. I was pulled forward so the maester could get a look at the back of my head. Something damp and cool dabbed at it and I sobbed in pain rather than grief this time. I did not know if it was my tears or the head injury but a fierce headache had started up and showed little signs of abating. Hmm, not as bad as it looks, your grace. Head wounds bleed a lot. Melos' voice was calm and cool as he gave his judgment and I wanted to scream at him for being so calm when Alice was dead. Viserys' warm hand folded around mine and I settled for another choked sob. It will heal without stitches. Her back and legs. His hand settled on my thigh above my knee and it was all I could do to not scream at him for an entirely different reason. Alice had once said he had the eyes of a pervert and that thought had me struggling from him and my crying renewed. The blurry figure of Melas raised his hands in defense at Viserys and Stefan's unseen reaction. I cannot examine her if she struggles, he whined. Then we will wait for her maester to arrive, said Viserys coolly. I suppose she does not wish a cervical examination, he sulked and if I had not been unable to move I would have flung myself at him. As it was both Viserys and I were prevented from doing such a thing by Sir Stefan seizing the grey rat by the front of his robes and frog marching him out of the room. She must rest but do not let her sleep. If she vomits call me back in. And keep an eye out for behavior changes, he shouted through the door. I should have prevented this. I should have ensured the bottles were double-checked. I will submit to whatever punishment you deem fit, 
your grace, Sir Stefan said as his blurry form crashed to a halt at the end of the bed. Viserys' hand rubbed the comforting circles on my shoulder, then it stilled. I caught his fingers with my hand and he dropped a kiss to my forehead. Who was responsible for checking them the first time around, Sir Darklin? From the dangerous tone in his voice he already knew and merely wanted the confirmation. I should feel sorry for him. Viserys was likely to kill him or worse and Joffrey had brought in people to check those bottles after he had and had found nothing amiss. Alice Strong was dead. Sir Kristen Cole, said Sir Stefan. He had them checked after the tourney. I see, he moved from my side and I whimpered at the loss even as he dropped another kiss to my forehead. Little fire, I shall find who did this. I'll find who tried to kill you and I shall see justice done. He had worn his white cloak for over a decade. He had been Lord Commander for three of those years. He had replaced the finest knight to ever serve, he had been destined for great things. He tried not to think of her. Tried not to think of the blood or the poison. Tried not to think of how helpless she looked in Darklin's arms. His mind would not obey. It taunted him, bringing her broken form across his mind's eye again and again. He hated her and loved her. He wanted her dead and wanted her alive. He wanted her at his mercy and wanted to follow her once more. When had he become so twisted? How did this happen? Viserys' scream was filled with rage. You were in charge of checking for this precise situation. He had no answer. He had checked. He'd done his due diligence. He'd missed something. He'd failed. Only luck had saved the princess. Luck and not her white knight. Your grace, said the queer little Sir Joffrey when he had nothing to say in his defense. I independently had the bottles checked. His king was pale with rage yet the knight seemed to not to care, he did not quail in the face of it. Lesser men had. Joffrey forged on with an officiousness that he wanted to sneer at. That was no true way for a knight to act. Yet this one had never acted like a knight, he recalled with disgust. That this Joffrey should have her esteem when she would not even look at him. This knight had more carnal knowledge of her husband than she likely did and she did not care. She held him close. She held that disgusting excuse for a lordling even closer. He burned with jealousy at the both of them. Those children should have been his. He had been hers in spirit, why not in body too? Both are more of a knight than you have ever been, whispered a voice from the recesses of his mind. The dark part that taunted him with his mistakes and failures. Sir Stefan gave me access to the work Sir Cole did in regards to checking for poison. The bottle was not listed amongst the items checked. Terror squirmed in his gut. Was this the bastard's revenge? Was this how he would get even for the blow that had crippled him? I compared it to my own lists. Curiously, the bottle was not listed there either. Confusion replaced the fear and then shame. This Joffrey Lon, no, Valerion, wanted only to protect her. Protect her in a way he had failed to. Shame burned in his gut then. So you both failed, his king said, hands clenched so tightly on the arms of his chair he feared they may break under the pressure. The other man shook his head. He was brave, this little knight. It was added to the cabinet afterwards. I do not know when but with Sir Stefan's aid I am undertaking a thorough questioning of everyone that had access to that room. You are my daughter's creature, Sir Valerion, said the king, his knuckles white with the effort of restraining himself. It is the only thing that has saved you from punishment for this failure. She will punish you herself, I have no doubt about that. The king paused as Joffrey seemed to realize the danger he was currently in. He tried not to feel satisfied at the fear he saw there for a brief moment. Then anger coursed through him. She would not punish her husband's lover. He would not share his fate. You were both in charge of keeping her safe, he yelled. Do either of you have any idea as to who did this? He felt his heart speed up at that and hoped the king could not see his fear. Alison had been unworried recently, happy even. She'd been so sure Renera would no longer be threat. He'd assumed it was her father, that even if the two quarreled, Otto was good enough to ensure Renera never laid a finger on the throne. It should be her throne, came the traitorous whisper, you swore to win it for her once. Your grace, I have not had Tim Dash, the king's hoarse yell prevented him from speaking further. I don't want your arse licking. I want to know who tried to kill my unborn grandchildren. Whose head do I need to put on a spike? Yours. He screamed and the knight recoiled slightly. Cole wanted to laugh, dealing with her temper was no true test for dealing with the king in a rage. I do not know. There are too many suspects. 
I have no proof either way. I need time to gather it. Joffrey almost babbled. The king was two seconds away from leaping up and braining the little knight, he sensed, he wanted answers not excuses. None of them said what was obvious to them all. Had the queen been responsible? She had the most to gain. The moment he had returned from seeing his daughter to the maester's tower he'd had the queen placed under guard. Not arrested but, under guard. Otto too. Had she done it? Finally tried to kill her hated rival. Was it his fault? No. No, she would not have done. She would not strike and risk him. Not without telling him, he had to believe that. He had her ear, he heard her commands and counsels. Who? Who could he offer up instead? Ah. Damon, he growled, attracting the attention of his king and Laner's man once again. Viserys' face twisted in anger and hatred and he did not know whether it was directed at him or the brother he had come to despise. The mushroom business, he forged onward, aware of how unwise it was to remind his king of what happened after yet being pushed to do so regardless by his own battered honor. It was a distraction. What if it was a distraction for the placement of the bottle? It would make sense, said Joffrey, spotting a lifeline. One last trap to remind us all we are not safe even if he has been forced to retreat for now. Should he keep his head, he would find some way to reward the man. He may be a sword swallower but he had proved he had honor. He had not let a grudge cloud his judgment. How amusing, whispered the dark part of his mind, that this man would have more honor than you. He swallowed hard at the thought as his king digested the information. He was still angry, still ready to tear a man apart with his own hands. Finally, he slammed his hands down across the table. You, he said to the Valerion. You find me who did this and you find me proof. The man got halfway through a bow before Viserys screamed at him to go. He hobbled off at speed, one last look directed his way. It was full of hate. He told himself he had needed to cripple the man. He had needed to shame Laner Valerion into doing his duty. It had worked. She was going to birth Valerion babes. If he had not, the Valerion cunt would still be carrying on with the knight, still be shaming the woman he low, he served once with every breath, with every beat of his heart. It was spite, murmured that same dark place, you tried to kill a man out of spite. There was no honor in what you did. Had you succeeded it would have been murder. Do you remember the day you entered my service? Asked Viserys and Cole felt fear prickle across the back of his neck. The king seemed almost calm, completely at odds with the rage he had displayed a moment earlier. You asked me if I would allow you the honor of pledging your sword to my daughter. He did not answer. This was a trap. He was to be his king's scapegoat. The focal point for his anger. Not even the queen, even if she had been at her most powerful, could save him now. He swallowed hard as the king drew blackfire. The smoky metal seemed to eat the light. A king's guard serves for life and his king would end his soon enough. What would they write of him in the white book? Would the new lord commander, whoever that would be, look upon him as a failed brother? Or would they remove his page and burn it with his cloak? Is it still an honor? I saw you rise to defend her from the world. Yet when she needed you the most you abandoned her. He did not add that he had left her to play lapdog to Alicent. He did not protest he had saved her from her hated uncle. His fate was sealed the moment the princess uncorked that bottle. The king drew in breath. You bring a cunt like Cory to the court itself, you put her and my grandchildren in danger. Cory had told the truth but he could not protest that fact now. It had done Alicent little good and the king loved her. Instead, he swallowed his retort and bore the king's anger. Bore the sight of black fire unsheathed. You failed her at every turn. You have failed me at every turn. Had those babes died tonight, I would have had your head. As it is, I am forced by custom to offer you a choice, the king's voice was low and dangerous. He screwed his eyes shut but the vision of black fire remained. How had he fallen so far? How had he failed so badly? He could not blame the queen, he had gone to her. He could not blame her, she had done everything required of her. That left one person. One person to blame. He opened his eyes once more. Grief became a storm inside him. He had failed to uphold the oaths he had sworn when he had been elevated to the king's guard. Yet redemption was not beyond him yet. If your grace permits, I wish to take the black. Se você gostou do conteúdo, não se esqueça de dar like e se inscrever no canal. Eu fico aqui, até a próxima!